Good. And the first item on the agenda is the executive director's report. Mr. Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just have two announcements about open public period, public comment periods that are uh, going on right now. The first is um, from May 13th to July 24th, 2019. There's an open public comment period on the proposed 2020 QHP Qualified Health Plan rate filings. And then the second uh, open public comment period on our website is on the 20, FY 2020 ACO budget guidance. That started last Wednesday, June 5th and it closes June 17th. And that is all I have to announce. Did you have anything, Mr. Parker? Okay, yep, we're all set. Thank you. Uh, the next item are the minutes of Monday, June 3rd and Wednesday, June 5th, 2019. Is there a motion? Second. It's been moved to uh, approve both sets of uh, minutes without any additions, deletions, or corrections. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so now we're going to shift. We're going to invite um, John and Anna to come down. And we're going to get the uh, quarterly update of UVM Milestone Report. Welcome on this beautiful day. <coughs> yes. Um, thank you very much uh, for having us for our quarterly uh, report. It's been uh, a lot of activity in between. Um, it's interesting, we're not going to uh, inundate you or put you to sleep with bounds of data. Different kind of work has happened since um, uh, we last came forward. Uh, my favorite kind of presentation, hello, thank you, take it away, Anna. <laughs> thank you, John. Um, so I'm going to start the presentation with just a, a reminder and regrounding on what our goal is for this project. Um, we are providing um, an analysis and engagement and planning necessary to design and create the UVM Health Network inpatient psychiatric facility and or unit that will substantially improve access to inpatient mental health care as part of an integrated system of care in Vermont. The inpatient um, psychiatry facility planning is grounded in a few principles. Those are that we will design and create a UVM Health Network inpatient psychiatric facility on the Central Vermont Medical Center campus that will substantially improve access to inpatient mental health care as part of an integrated system of care in Vermont. We'll anchor our planning in a data-driven, evidence-based process to the degree that that's possible and we're committed to providing a forum for interested stakeholders to give input to inform the planning process. And I think the uh, board has heard us um, talk about the psychiatric and patient planning stakeholders team. We meet quarterly and their next meeting is July 9th. We also wanna create opportunities to share information publicly, including community forums, legislative briefings, media relations, public reporting, et cetera. And we did meet with Commissioner Squirrel about a month ago just to bring her up to speed on all the data and the process to date. Um, and she found, I think, found that helpful. We have a supporting structure that we're utilizing to um, do this planning process. Um, all of this work, of course, reports to Dr. Brumstead. And both myself and Dr. Parentini serve as chairs. Um, Dr. Parentini uh, sends his regrets that he's not here today. He normally would be here presenting the programming piece, but he had a full schedule of patients, so was unable to attend today. We also have a steering committee that is a broad uh, variety of constituents that meet quarterly. Uh, we actually met uh, yesterday and gave them an update similar to what we'll be giving you today. And then we have a, a psychiatric and patient capacity planning committee that meets more regularly about every other week and again they're really more in the weeds and supporting the work as we move forward. So previous um, hearings we've talked about phase one where we identified the size and scope of the facility. We are now squarely focused on phase two which is design and operational requirements. 
For phase two, we've um, refined the supporting structure to include a few other elements. The first one is a facility programming piece, which I'll spend the mo most of um, our day today discussing. Um, we also have a facility location team that's meeting to um, discuss, uh, discuss and um, articulate where a potential location would be on the CVMC campus, a schematic design group, a financial and operational impact group, and then finally a CON and outreach group. Um, and I'll talk about those in a little bit more depth in a bit. The project timeline um, in May of uh, this year, we have now completed the programming piece. Um, that work is done. Uh, we are moving into facility location identification. We hope to complete that by the end of this month to early July. Next in August, we, uh, we are targeting to complete the schematic design for the facility. In September, we're looking to complete the business planning process and um, get re internal approvals for the business plan, and we're driving to a December 2019 CON submission. I'm gonna spend the rest of the time just really getting into more detail about space and facility programming. So um, our goal for this phase of the project is really to identify the space and facility requirements to support the care provided to people receiving adult inpatient psychiatric care and services at CBMC. In an earlier Green Mountain Care Board hearing, we presented the analysis of needed bed capacity in Vermont and the IMD rules that will limit the number of additional psychiatric beds that can be built at CBMC. And I think you'll recall we arrived at the number 40 in total. The programming work that continued after our last presentation was focused on identifying the staffing and programming space needed to provide care for tier one, tier two and three, and then um, patients entering the facility. So we, do, we identified three work, work groups that focused on those three areas, tier one, tier two and three, and intake. Each work group met for two, for three two-hour sessions, and it was facilitated by HALSA Advisors, which is a planning consulting group that we use within the network. A total of 48 individuals gave their time and knowledge to this process, and I just want to pause and acknowledge all of those individuals. This is not um, a light lift. They were actively engaged. They attended all those meetings, and there was some really robust discussion and input, which I think was incredibly valuable to the process. They began their work on March 19th, and they completed their work on March 10th. Excuse me, May 10th, thank you, John. Their efforts were focused on reviewing operational processes, staffing, and the space needed to assess and treat patients in the facility. They gave their input uh, freely and shared their perspectives on space, processes needed um, on an inpatient unit, including patient rooms, how food would be delivered, environmental services, therapeutic and green space, and staff work to support the care processes. The outcome were recommendations related to staffing and space tables that correspond to the functions identified in operating the total inpatient psychiatric service at Central Vermont Medical Center. In addition to the work group session, three site visits were conducted to inform the process. And how we arrived at those sites is, first we took advantage of the site closest to us, the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital, and then we leveraged um, a consortium that we have um, involvement in, that's a national consortium of academic centers that have community hospitals. And I reached out to um, COO colleagues and asked them of the group who had uh, built or renovated an inpatient psychiatric unit in the last five years. From that, we had 25 respondents. We interviewed all 25 of those organizations, leaders and teams, and came down to two um, areas sites that we visited. One was Lancaster Behavioral Health Hospital in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. It opened in June of 2018. It's a large facility, 218 beds with a variety of subspecialty units. And that gave the teams that visited a real variety of space and uh, support, support space to enable care of, of the population that we're treating. And then we also visited uh, Regents Hospital in St. Paul, Minnesota, which opened in December of 2012. It has five 20 bed units, so a total of 100 beds, and they provide care to the similar um, patient types that we're looking to support in our organization as well, tier one, tier two, and tier three. 
Insights from those site visit participants were brought back to the work groups and lessons learned were shared. Um, again, all of the work groups had really good exchanges, lots of shared learning across. Um, HALSA took the feedback and suggestions from each of those meetings and continuously modified the documents to describe each of the three program areas. At the last session, we actually had the architects that are going to be going with us on this journey um, join the session so that they could hear the insights from the teams, and we, um, they, that's just, we hope, will expedite the architectural and schematic design in the next phase. At the end of all of the work groups, each work group approved the final document. So this is just a list of all the individuals that participated. As you can see, it's um, very multidisciplinary. I uh, particularly want to acknowledge the peer um, advocates that were participants as well as patient and family advisors that are part of our patient and family centered care program. But you can see there were a variety of individuals that participated, 48 um, in number, and um, all of the work groups were facilitated by HALSA advisor. Um, additionally, I want to mention that for Tier 1, we um, solicited input from the Vermont Psychiatric Care Hospital. We, again, thank them for their participation. They shared their lessons learned of what they would do differently if they had the opportunity in their own organization, and that also was a very rich discussion. And what really what we found happened in these work groups is there was a, a nice exchange of professional knowledge, personal experience, and then the input from these site visits really made for, I think, a very rich and um, in-depth programming plan. The slide, the space and staffing tables are a result of all this work. And um, these, they're used to inform the next stage of planning, which is the schematic design, which is just kicking off this week, and that's being led by our architect. So as mentioned, um, we've revised the project planning support structure for this phase of the project. Um, these were outlined in the schematic that were back on slide five. But we broke it down into four teams that will continue the work now in this phase of the project. One team will focus on identification of the facility location. And we're taking uh, results of all the programming space tables and beginning the work to size the psychiatric capacity and identify also the location on the CBMC campus. And again, we want to align the location with Central Vermont Medical Center's long-term master's facilities planning process. Another team, which is launching this week, is working specifically on schematic design. So they're starting now and will focus on a design layout for tier one patients, tier two and three who have similar uh, treatment characteristics, and then the intake through the emergency department. We are asking for the individuals that were part of the programming to stay with us on this phase of our planning journey. So peer advocates and other members are being asked if they would participate in this as well. Again, their insights were invaluable to us um, in the programming phase, and we believe that they'll have the same effect in the schematic design. So we want to build on all the knowledge that they've gained by going through this very iterative process. A third group is focused on financial and operational impacts. That group will identify operating and capital costs for the inpatient psychiatric facility, and they will develop plans for capital funding and assumptions driving reimbursement to support inpatient operational planning in the future. And then the last team will focus on outreach, engagement, and then um, drafting the certificate of need, which again, we're driving towards a December 2019 submission. Um, and as I mentioned previously, the next inpa uh, inpatient psychiatric planning stakeholders team is July 9th, and we'll be sharing with them uh, more in depth the results of the planning, and we're um, asking if some of the participants would share their experience of being part of that process with the whole constituency. So with that, I'll pause. And we're happy to answer any questions, obviously. Mr. Huh? Well, first I want to thank you all for um, the, the, the work and the timeline. It's, uh, this all started back in March of 2018, and here we are some less than a year and a half down the road, and you're hiring architects and, and seeing a, a, a kind of an ending to the planning and design process uh, in December of this, this month, so that's a lot of effort um, in a short period of time. Um, 
couple of questions. Um, so in your 25 interviews with kind of recently candidates or for recently built facilities and the two that you visited, um, did you get, especially with the two that you visited, did you get a sense that they were state-of-the-art facilities and did you get any sense of what the construction cost per bed was? Um, I think that they, they, I personally did not go on the, um, the site visits, but from what I understand from those who did, that um, they saw a lot of what they uh, labeled as best practices, things that they would want to replicate in our facility. They also, um, I think the individuals that they visited were very forthright in sharing things that they would change, um, even though one of the facilities was built in 2018. So they were very willing to share, you know, we, we thought this would work, this is um, not ideal, this is why, and so they were very open to sharing sort of um, their lessons learned. They did allow us to take some photographs of the, the building facility itself. Um, I don't know that they disclosed the actual costs of the facility, um, and as we go down the road, we can certainly um, get back to them and, and have that detail of conversation with them. But because it was a multidisciplinary group that went, um, I think they were focused more on operations and the, the design and how the flow worked, programming that they had, um, and they were even picking up on color schemes and artwork and those sorts of things and learning from the individuals that they visited with what's working well and what would they do differently if they had the opportunity. Um, uh uh, obviously, my role in the network includes uh, uh, overall understanding <clears throat> our capital uh, capital allocation uh, uh, debt, uh, and so in that context, uh, we've started to really just, in very rough terms, understand what this type of commitment uh, is uh, going to mean. Again, before we're really looking at sources or anything like that. And um, it obviously goes hand in glove with site selection uh, on the campus and how it uh, dovetails with uh, Set Vermont's facility needs. Um, just total um, back of the napkin at this point, and obviously this will get, uh, we'll have laser focus on this over the next four or five months. Um, uh, we're looking at um, three to five times uh, the commitment that we made back in uh, uh, March of 17 to really get this project uh, uh, over the finish line. But again, that's obviously really rough, but uh, it gives you sort of the bookends of, of what we're thinking. So, so it seems by, according to the timeline, that by time September comes around, we should have a tighter set of bookends on both the operational cost per bed um, and the construction cost per bed. Um, there'll be tighter bookends, definitely, because we will have done the site selection there. They will have gotten into schematic design. But until we really get the business planning down and get probably within three or four weeks of uh, actual CON submission, the numbers are going to move, and that just, uh, not dramatically, obviously, it'll get less and less as we get closer and closer to submitting the, uh, the CON. But that's, the, ex uh, the cost obviously goes hand in glove with the design elements uh, as they uh, come on. So probably in our next quarterly uh, we, uh, meeting, we can be a little bit more specific. Um, uh, but uh, there's, it still will be a, a bookend kind of financial uh, estimate. That who, 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 who is, what's the architect's firm you know, that you selected? Uh, E4H. Um, at E4H, more, formerly more Switzer. And we have literally decades of experience um, uh, in Vermont and with our organizations with both HALSA and E4H, which I think has been an accelerant to our process. They know us really well. We know and, and trust their work. And, uh, and they have uh, both HALSA and E4H have uh, shown um, uh, willingness and capacity if there's one little thing that they need some special expertise to go out uh, and, and find that expertise, which uh, I found very useful over time working with them.
they also both have um, both planning and um, design experience with inpatient psychiatric facilities, which was also important. Other questions from the board? Just a quick one. In all of your research, um, is there something that you've learned that's unique to Vermont, like that would not be transferable from the Lancaster or the Minnesota site? Is there anything that makes our delivery system or our existing infrastructure mm -hmm. unique? Yeah, I, I didn't hear anything from the groups. So the clinicians coming, and I hope everybody on the board and everybody in the room uh, feels good about this. Um, uh, from the clinicians, particularly, that went to the Lancaster site, um, their biggest takeaway was the vast majority, 90 plus percent of the people that were inpatients in that facility wouldn't be inpatients in Vermont. They'd be taken care of in the, uh, in the community or with uh, other services, which they found uh, uh, reinforcing and uh, uh, a good takeaway. But there were also design elements, particularly for Tier 3, that they, they took from that facility. But, you know, I wasn't on the site visits either, but, you know, in hearing people coming back, that sort of uh, was a, oh, that's nice. Thank you. Were the Lancaster and the uh, St. Paul sites uh, co-located with the hospital? Um, they, one was a, a standalone facility, and the other one was uh, uh, connected to um, another you know, larger hospital site. So, but one was literally in the middle of uh, land that had nothing around it. It's quite a large campus, though. So, as part of that site visit, the one that was co-located, did they also get an opportunity to speak with uh, people inside the hospital side to see how things crashed? <coughs> and yes. Yes, they. Um, I think they. Uh, both for, um, organizations were wonderful hosts. So we they met with the leadership team first, and um, then they met with the clinicians in the the psych units, and they had an opportunity to speak with administration from the hospital side as well as the leaders of the psychiatric facility. They were very forthcoming. Yeah, it was great. It's it's great to see all the people because you know no matter how hard you try, there's always going to be a little incidents that occur along the way. You know, recently we uh, had an emergency CON from a relatively new um, psych unit in Rutland. And we hate to see any similar mistakes repeated. So it's, it's good to see that uh, the T's are being crossed and the I's are being dotted. So thank you for that. Absolutely, and I think that's really the power of the site visits. Um, of, there's nothing that replaces actual seeing an organization and seeing how it functions. There's a big difference between design and actual living in the space, and um, I think they were also very forthcoming with what their lessons learned would be, and as I mentioned before, even for the facility that just opened in 2018, they had lessons learned. They also shared with us that as we move through our process, they're very willing to work with us collaboratively um, and continue to um, stay in a partnership with them just to share what we're learning and what we're experiencing. So a uh, very collegial approach, um, which, was, which was very helpful, I think, for the team. And again, I want to thank the individuals that went, um, including a peer advocate, um, which I think was also very powerful for um, that individual as well as the whole team to see um, both of these organizations and think about those organizations in contrast to what we're trying to achieve within this space that we're designing. Um, so nice experience for them. At this point, we'll open it up to the public for any comments. Ken. Thank you. Um, you look way too relaxed. Pardon? You look way too relaxed. <clears throat> I'm jealous. Well, I've been trying to think of negative things to say as an old advocate. So <laughs> hard, hard job here. Um, I think last time I, I did say that um, this has been a strong team as things have moved forward. And I'm certainly not ready to say that uh, uh, Anna Noonan and Dr. John Brumstead are part of the dream team. Uh, but they are showing you know, some real potential. So I, I think as, as a member of the, one of the advisory committees, I, I have to say that um, it's been a very open process and good dialogue. Um, at the same time, uh, you know, it's almost too relaxed 
and feels good when in fact over the next couple of years, including tonight, there'll be people who can't get access to emergency, to, to psychiatric beds sitting in hospitals in emergency rooms. You know, it's, it's very tranquil here, but if you're one of the family members with a patient in an emergency room, this is a bizarre and horrible crisis. And so I, I, I can't help but mention that. It's actually a disgrace um, and the fact that the governor and the legislature really did nothing, in my opinion, to significantly address the issue is really unfortunate, but that's just a, an editorial. However, there's a couple of things I did want to ask about and, and ask uh, the leaders of the project and, and the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, there's no great secret that the board made a very interesting, in some ways, uh, courageous decision to put aside what, what will be over $20 million towards this, this initiative. And I do wonder, since a year has gone by, uh, has the board received or is there a public uh, way of accessing the question of what's the first year budget report? Uh, you know, in state government, as lax as it can be at times, there's usually a public disclosure of where money is spent and how. And it's, not, it's in no way a negative criticism, although it could be. It's certainly a negative criticism that there isn't a, a you know, on, on front of us right now, just a, a one year report. And I, I assume the board has seen it, so they know where the money that's been allocated has gone. So that's one question. And the second question really um, is, is a different question, though I'll just say it very quickly. For many, many decades, actually, I tried to uh, stimulate more interest in the private hospital sector to do a project like this. <clears throat> Going back, I remember the first time I talked about it was with a young member of the house from Burlington. I think it was a doctor, Howard Dean. And we talked about shouldn't hospitals be stepping up to the plate. And the reason always given, or often given, very often informally, was in essence, running a, a psychiatric unit in a hospital is a money loser. And there was not much incentive, frankly, on the financial realm, just to be grossly honest about it. So the question I also have, the second question I have is, on a scale of one to 10, given what UVM Medical Network knows now, what's the probability of actually being able to financially pull this off when seemingly over decades, no hospital has been able or willing, and I think it's very much because of the, there are other reasons, but the financial reason is a major one. So those are two different questions. One is, where's the budget, and so where's the expenditures? I'll, I'll start uh, tackling the, nit, the first one initially, and then pass it off to uh, John and Anna. But basically, uh, all the reports that we receive from UVM are posted to our website. And Susan has just assured me that she will forward you that information so that you have it directly. So we're always transparent. Anything that we receive gets posted. So John, you want to handle the second part? Um, yeah, just to uh, reiterate, it is part of what we agreed to right up front in these quarterly written reports to the Green Mountain Care Board uh, that it would include um, the spend uh, to date. Um, there are two inpatient units at the University of Vermont Medical Center. Forget the census of each, it's about um, <clears throat> uh, 20 or so um, uh, beds in each of those units. And um, the uh, medical center, if you just look at a P&L, a profit and loss with usual cost allocations, um, there's a loss of about $2 million per year per unit, so $4 million total. Um, there are models, particularly those that have evolved over the past several years, where there's reimbursement, particularly for level one patients that um, do uh, cover uh, the costs uh, of caring for these uh, complex patients. and. Um, uh, we have not 
begun those conversations with the Agency of Human Services or the state, but now's the time to start doing that. So over the summer, we will begin to engage with the leadership of the Department of Mental Health and AHS on um, uh, that because obviously that's a, uh, as you point out, Ken, a critical element to put in the business plan that's a critical element to be part of the CON because it's not going to uh, support any of us or this very vulnerable patient population if we're not covering the costs of the services because you know what happens when you have services that where the costs aren't being covered, they get short shrifted and we're not going to allow that to happen. So we're going to start those conversations. We haven't had them yet. Necessary ingredient in the business plan and the CON. So it'll be very transparent when they get to that point. Other public comments, questions? We got it. I think that's it. Thank you very much for your time. I think that might be a record. One question. <laughs>
uh, is very challenging without the other definitions. So I'll explain as we get to each section. Um, but for example, third next available appointment seems very standard. Um, it's defined by a federal organization or national organization, but it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, the shortcomings of the data or the analysis are described in, in each section, each of the three sections, and we are planning to solicit feedback for the next time that we do this. Um, so please, as you interpret the data, please consider it in the context of the considerations listed in each section. Any questions so far? All right, hand over to you, Michelle. Okay. So I'm going to walk through uh, the quality improvement initiative. So as you'll recall, we also included a set of all pair model um, agreement measures in last year's budget guidance. Uh, the year prior, we had used a couple of different metrics um, for hospital comparison. So again, we're looking at the same uh, set that we looked at last year. And I, you'll see in my recommendation, but I would obviously propose we continue to do this through the duration of the agreement. So a couple of things to just note here um, the, in terms of methodology, um, I wanted to just call out. So the latest uh, Blueprint Community Health Profiles include data about all the people living in each Blueprint Health Service area um, who are in Vermont's all-payer claims database, VCURES. So previous profiles included a subset of people who received their care at Blueprint patient-centered medical homes. Um, so the change that they made really aims to make the profiles more inclusive, offering the most complete possible picture of health care and people um, in all people of the given community. However, this means that we can't compare this year's results to last year's results in terms of the information that we're looking at here. So you won't see a comparison to what was included in the fiscal year, oh, hospitals, 2019 budgets. <laughs> um, in this document for any blueprint measures, and that's something that moving forward we cannot do, the methodology has changed. Um, another thing I wanted to point out, aside from some of the things on the, on the board here, are that some of these data, I know um, we often get told that they're old or they're outdated, but I wanted to remind folks that um, when I pulled this data and put it together for the purposes of this non-financial report, it was in February. And so as we move forward, um, there is a very real possibility that a lot of these will update by the time you have hospital budget hearings in August. Um, I will leave it to the board to decide if you'd like to receive updated information prior to the budget hearings. Um, I'd be happy to provide that to you, or if you would like the hospitals to utilize what they've already submitted um, for this non-financial reporting piece at the hearings, should you have questions on any of the information given to you. Just something I wanted to caveat that there's a very good chance these things will change. Um, Additionally, I want to point out that targets that will be shown in the next couple of slides are statewide targets um, that we are responsible for meeting by 2022. So while we think it's important to look at each hospital service area or hospital specifically, um, just remember that really it's a statewide look that we're responsible for in for meeting the terms of the agreement. Okay, so I'm going to give you two looks at this data. So here we're looking at, at results as applicable that are compared to the all pair model targets. And this looks really blurry, but I don't have my glasses on, so maybe it's not. <laughs> uh, so this is a subset of the 20 measures. Um, so I just also know a lot of all pair model measures have benchmarks that are, or targets that are national percentiles, and those are sort of moving rates, so those are not included here. Um, these are only measures that have sort of that set number that we can really compare to. Um, so here, Indicators uh, shaded in orange are showing performance below the target, and indicators shaded in green are meeting or exceeding the all-pair model target. Um, and this, this look does include two measures in the blueprint profiles. Again, we're not comparing to last year, so we're just looking at the comparison to the target here. So those 30-day follow-up measures were included. Um, variations in some of the other measures that we could compare to targets, um, I've opted to not include here, um, think like suicide rates, because they fluctuate so much year to year, um, and because one person can really create a pretty large difference in the data, um, I've just opted to not include those ones uh, in this analysis. Um, 
So we can see here that with the 2017 calendar year, which is what we're looking at, um, we're meeting or exceeding in four of the targets, again, on the statewide level. So those four are the 30-day follow-up, um, for mental health, COPD prevalence, hypertension prevalence, and diabetes prevalence. Um, and then we're missing out on three of them. However, again, remember that these are targets for 2022, so any progress is really key here. This one's very colorful. <laughs> uh, so again, two looks. So here, um, it might get a little confusing because we're not looking at the same subset of measures as the previous slide, but it's pretty close. So um, what I wanted to do here is look at where applicable and appropriate a comparison to last year's performance on the same indicators. So again, this would have been the comparison that was included in the hospital's fiscal year 19 budget guidance document. So again, this is not any updated information from them, I simply pulled what we gave the hospitals to respond to last year and compared it to what we gave the hospitals to respond to this year. Um, so here, any areas highlighted in blue are showing improvement, yellow are showing no change from the previous year, and purple are showing a decline. And I will note that on some of the declines, because it looks very purple, um, it's usually maybe one percentage point two at most. It's not a huge, um, discrepancy, or I'm sorry, a huge decline. Um, another thing I wanted to point out here, um, well, so here I'll, I'll call out, so table 2B, which is the one in the middle there, um, and I will thank Dr. Holmes for uh, talking with me about this earlier. So um, here we're talking about improvement, right? So deaths to drug overdose, obviously a lower number is an improvement, not a higher number. So that one's a little, you could consider it inverse, but it's not. <laughs> Uh, I did want to point out here that I took a different approach in this year's guidance document than last year for the last table listed. That's why that bottom row is not shaded in any color. Um, in an effort to provide more context to, to the emergency department visit information, I opted to include another data point, which is the percentage of those ED visits in 2017 specifically that resulted in an inpatient admission um, to sort of help the hospitals in responding to this um, indicator in their um, non-financial reporting responses. Um, I had found it to be a really interesting data point. You know, we're seeing um, an average of 17% of ED visits resulting in an inpatient admission. Again, those are visits with a primary diagnosis within the mental disorders category, which is what we use, um, the grouping that we use to identify these. Um, that's approximately 2,200, a little over 2,200 people. Um, Some key themes that I noticed uh, throughout the responses um, were definitely utilization of existing state programs for community benefit. So those are things like the diabetes prevention workshops, the tobacco cessation groups that are held. Uh, many hospitals have those offered through their community wellness initiatives. Um, and a lot of themes related to emergency department and substance use or mental health. But also um, one that I found really interesting was for those patients who present to the ED with no primary care provider listed, hospitals working to set them up with someone within their area. Um, and that came up in more than one hospital response, which I found um, really exciting. Um, so, and also just general processes in place for identifying patients needing services. So a lot of times we see that um, common theme with like well child visits, things like that, that practices are already running to make sure that their patients are being seen as needed. Um, so a lot, again, uh, uh, to mental health and substance use, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, talk of staffing for patients presenting in the ED who need these services, talking about medication assisted treatment initiation in the emergency department, that came up several times. Um, we're also talking about transitioning ED space into safe and private areas for patients who are awaiting admission elsewhere. Um, so recommendations moving forward, I think moving into year three of the quality measurement reporting, so for their fiscal year 2021 budgets, um, we could consider trending in some areas where it's appropriate and continue to look at those over time as we move um, on through the agreement 
our first federal report is due at the end, uh, towards the end of this year in September. So I kind of left this note here. It's kind of vague, just in case, but. At a time we may consider a deeper dive into certain measures for the guidance moving forward, I think you know until we really have a good look at all of that data and an understanding of what we might be seeing or variations across HSA, um, then we might have more pointed questions we may ask the hospitals in future years as we start doing more of those federal reporting and those deeper dives. And then of course, consistency within our regulatory processes is always a top priority. So um, we've also asked the ACO to respond to the all-pair model quality measures in their budget guidance, as well as a response to any of their payer contracts. Um, so all the quality measures that are in their payer contracts in their guidance as well. So you'll hear from me again on some of the same things at ACO budget hearing time, um, because we've, like I said, we've also asked them to sort of put their take on some of this. Do you all have any questions for me before we move on, or do you want to hold everything until the end? Um, thank you. Thank you both. This is great. Uh, it's really nice to have a statewide kind of look at what's going on with the quality measurement, um, understanding how many different players participate in, in reaching these. Uh, I was actually heartened by, that there was any blue in the deaths related to drug overdose. Mm -hmm. Like that there's any at all to me is awesome. I hope that that means we're making some progress in that area. Yeah. Um, so that was the comment that I that just struck me. I was expecting to see a lot of purple in that yep. line, and there is still a lot of purple, but at least um, there seems to be some stabilizing and improvement in some areas. Yeah, state. absolutely. Anyone else before we switch forward to the community health needs assessment? Community health assessment. Before we go off the results, I just wanted to spend a couple minutes reviewing what is a community health needs assessment, how we use it, how it's used in the state. Um, so first of all, and as we know, it is um, a requirement of the, for of the Affordable Care Act, and it amended the IRS code. It added sections to the IRS code that requires nonprofit hospitals to conduct a community health needs assessment and adopt an implementation plan once every, at least once every three years. The purpose of this sort of um, initiative is for communities, the hospital, to identify healthcare and health-related needs of the community. So it's not just healthcare, it's not just what kind of medical services they need, it's also food-related or housing-related. It's any sort of need that, would, that could um, affect a medical condition. Um, once that's done, once the needs are identified, then the community the hospital can um, assess unmet needs and develop strategies to address them, and it helps organizations coordinate efforts so there aren't multiple efforts moving in the same direction. Um, the requirements as set forth in the IRS code are that the assessment needs to define the community that's served. That's usually a geographic community, and um, at least in Vermont, sometimes that community served expand, goes into another state, so there's communities in New York or New Hampshire, even Massachusetts, that are part of Vermont community health needs assessments. Um, the assessment needs to describe the process and methods used to conduct the assessment. They need to um, list what community input was received. They need to require, request community input and then list what community input was received. They need to prioritize the need, um, the needs that come in, and describe the resources that would be needed to address the needs. So these are the requirements of the assessments. However, there's no standard methodology that's been set forth by the IRS. So the hospitals have adopted their own methodologies to, um, to um, comply with this requirement. In Vermont, the way that it's used, the Department of Health is kind of at the beginning of the end. They um, create a lot of the qualitative data that is used to create these reports, and then they use the community health needs assessments in their own initiatives or their own priority setting. Um, Green Mountain Care Board, we use it in CON review, hospital budget review. Um, we're trying to integrate it to some other initiatives like the ATRAP, the Health Resource Allocation Plan. And then the hospitals themselves use their own community health needs assessments. Um, I will say that there's a there's someone from the Department of Health here today, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly, for coming here. It's nice to meet you. We've never met before, so thank you for being here. Um, and Kelly is here observing and taking notes. 
Um, so although there's no standard methodology, there is a common methodology, and I'll just go through this quickly, but it's important to understand how these reports are created, because we use them, and it's important to know how, what the methodology is. So firstly, there is almost always an advisory committee or a steering committee, and on that committee, it's a, usually a very broad group of individuals. The reason that the steering committee is important is because several times along the way there's judgment calls. There's judgment calls about what the survey should look like, who should be surveyed, how should we interpret this data. We didn't really get the results we were looking for, how can we reuse this or, or not use it at all. So generally it's members of the hospital um, staff, leadership of the staff, um, leadership of the hospital, the Department of Health is, is usually involved. Um, community organizations like United Way, the Housing Authority, Building Bright Futures, law enforcement is oftentimes involved because they are significantly involved with the community and sometimes the needs have a law enforcement effect. Um, so in addition to the advisory committee, the assessment usually has a quantitative research component, which I mentioned the Department of Health produces several reports that are used to identify um, the indicators in the community. Um, so the breathless, in addition to listing a couple, the breathless the behavioral risk factor surveillance system, the youth risk behavior survey, um, census surveys, any kind of secondary data that can be used to understand the community better. And then the third component is the qualitative research, which is um, the community input. It's talking to community members one-on-one, -on -one, sending out surveys, setting up focus groups. Um, some of the limitations of this kind of, of um, data collection, one of the hospitals put it in a way I liked is that it was, they were very upfront about it saying, this is more of an anecdotal approach to understand the communities than a scientific approach. But nevertheless, it's an important perspective. It's the community's perspective about what their needs are. So just a simple overview about what a common methodology is. Um, the hospitals are required to produce a community health assessment once every three years, and this is the schedule. So this year, um, Central Vermont Medical Center in Springfield updated their community health needs assessment, and then there's a big batch that's expected to be updated in 2021. So we're actually working with relatively recent data from most of the hospitals right now. So what did we do with this data? Um, we asked hospitals to prioritize their community needs numerically, um, with one representing the highest priority. We did not limit the number of responses. So some submitted four needs, some submitted up to 14 needs. Um, the categories were based on previous community health needs assessments, so we gave them sort of a pre-populated list and gave them an opportunity to add others if they needed to. And then we tried to assess um, the financial resources that were allocated to community benefits. Um, this is a question that's come up a lot from the Green Mountain Care Board, from other state agencies that are very curious about how the hospitals are investing in the community, how much are they investing in their community. Um, we did this by looking at the implementation plans that support the community assessments and also at Schedule H of the IRS 990 form, which is a schedule that nonprofit hospitals use to identify community benefits. Um, some of the considerations. So this is, you know, when you look at the results, consider these things, is that um, it became clear that even the word need had a different meaning, could have a different meaning in different contexts. So, for example, and I like to use one example because I think it's very relevant, is that um, substance use disorder, it's, it's, a, it's a need in the community and it's a critical priority in the community. And a hospital could, could list it as a need in their community health needs assessment because it's a critical priority. But they could choose not to list it because if it is such a critical priority and they're devoting enough resources, they may consider it a met need, not an unmet need. So it was very interesting that hospitals could um, interpret the word need differently. And you'll see that 13 out of the 14 hospitals reported that substance use disorder was a need, but one did not. And we know for a fact that there is an issue in that community that the hospital feels as though they're meeting the need. Um, something else that can skew the results is, again, we did, not, we did not limit the number of responses. So if one hospital reported four, but another reported 18, that can skew the results and we're trying to weight them. Um, the category definitions themselves are 
sometimes overlapping. So for example, physical activity and obesity, that's one of the categories. Well, that can overlap with another category, which is access to nutritious foods. Um, substance abuse can overlap with mental health. Mental health can overlap with um, domestic and sexual assault. So it's very hard to kind of put things in a cookie cutter, but nevertheless, it's important when you're prioritizing your needs and doing, doing an analysis. Um, and then one other thing that kind of can skew the results um, is that we did a hospital could use number one once, so they could say substance or mental health is number one, and substance abuse is number two, and physical um, activity is number three, or they could say all three of those are my number one priority. So we didn't limit how the hospitals ranked them. So that's a long way of getting to this slide, um, which is the results. So it's ranked from um, the least number of results down to the most number of results. And the bottom axis is the number of hospitals. So there's 14 hospitals in Vermont. And you can see that mental health, all 14 hospitals reported that mental health was a priority in their community, followed by substance use disorder. But I would probably call substance use 14 out of 14 as well, because there was a one hospital that um, identified it as a critical need, but feel, felt as though they're meeting the need. Um, Michelle, I was gonna ask if you wanted to call out any of the measures that are, are related to the all pair model. Sure thing. So, uh, if we go from the sort of the top down to the, the most need, um, we fit almost every single all pair model measure into one of these groupings. So starting with suicide, we have a suicide deaths per 100,000 rate. Um, going down to tobacco and smoking, we have a tobacco use assessment and cessation inter intervention measure. Um, going down to chronic conditions, we have statewide prevalence of three chronic conditions, COPD, diabetes, and hypertension. There's also a Medicare-specific chronic conditions target as part of the agreement. We go down to access to care, and preventative services, and primary care. We have um, a Medicaid adolescents with well care visits measure, the percent of adults reporting they have a usual primary care provider, asthma medication management, uh, a Medicare, cons uh, the CAPS, so the survey uh, composite question on timely care appointments and information. And then if I sort of lump the last two, substance use disorder and mental health, um, we have deaths related to drug overdose, we have initiation and engagement of alcohol and other drugs, we have discharge after the emergency department uh, for uh, follow-up for mental health and alcohol or other drugs, we have substance abuse and mental health ED visits, we have the Vermont Prescription Monitoring System opioid <laughs> scripts. Uh, we have screening for clinical depression and a follow-up, and we also have the number of the Vermont population receiving medication-assisted treatment. So that's literally all but one all-payer model measure, and I would argue that you could fit the last one into the primary care access one, which is uh, Medicaid enrollees who are aligned with the ACO. However, I didn't think it fit perfectly, so I left it out. But, so that's 19 of the 20 um, that fit within the categories that the hospitals identified as their highest needs. Any questions so far? All right. Um, this next chart um, shows that, so this is, it's titled Community Need and Underlying Need. And the reason that we included these is because um, Part of what makes assessment and gap analysis so difficult is not only understanding the needs, the substance abuse, mental health, tobacco, but understanding the underlying needs, um, especially in rural communities like we have here in Vermont. So um, for those of you who can't see what's up here, it says, um, this is, and this, these are samples from, from Malice Cutney's uh, 2018 community assessment. This chart says most significant barriers to exa uh, accessing services. And this is the perspective of key stakeholders. Number one is lack of transportation. Um, number two is inability to pay out of pocket expenses. Um, difficulty navigating the healthcare system. Um, all the way down to childcare. Basic needs aren't met. So this is going even deeper than I couldn't, I can't, I can't see my primary care, as I can't see my primary care provider because of these underlying needs. And then the chart on the right goes over even a little bit deeper and it's talking about the underserved population. So these are 
categories of people, age, race, gender. Um, so it's a very interesting analysis. It's, it's not enough to just say these are our medical or medical related needs. These are some of the barriers to um, accessing the service. So <coughs> the reason I put this up here, Mountain Study did a great job, and there was lots of great um, uh, uh, samples in, the, in all the assessments. But this type of analysis would be very useful in assessing patient access in terms of looking beyond patient wait times, which we'll see in a little bit, um, and workforce issues, which we see over and over and over again. This chart's just kind of another way of looking at the top needs. Um, so this is a list of any need that was assigned a numerical value of one. So this means that a hospital said this is our number one or one of our number one priorities. Um, and it is sort of listed from the mental health which had the most number ones. Oops, I meant to number one. Mental health which had the most number ones down to early childhood and family supports which had the least num number of number ones. All right, this next chart. Um, finally, we attempted to assess financial resources that have been dedicated to community benefits. Um, the first place we looked was the implementation plan that supports the community health needs assessment and um, spoiler alert, they're not all done the same way. So some include a financial budget that supports the community health needs, some do not. Um, and some projects span multiple community health needs. So one of the examples I pulled out was um, Rise Vermont is a program that improves primary prevention, physical activity, social supports. This would hit several of the categories, um, but it's one, one line and one check. So um, it's, it's really hard to say how each one of those topics from that large chart is, is being financially invested into. Um, we also look at the schedule age of the 990, and there's kind of like a blow up of, the, of what we asked for. Specifically, we asked for um, this other part, other benefits, E through K. Um, so again, the hospitals are using this all different ways. Um, they might include medical, medical projects only. Um, they might include grants only. They might include unreimbursed charity only. The hospitals are not using this all the same way. Um, some of the ways that it is being used is um, some hospitals are including investments in their medical assisted treatment programs, um, expansion of mental health services in the emergency room, um, investments in Rise Vermont, smoking cessation, giving out free EpiPens. So some hospitals are using this way, using six, um, Schedule H this way, some are not. So as we found it very challenging to put a dollar value on community needs, really we wanted to just take a step back and. Um, ask the question, instead of asking how much, how much, do, how many dollars are being invested into the community, um, perhaps a more appropriate or relevant would question to ask is how much investment is enough or how does the hospital know that they're meeting the needs or how does the hospital know that they're not meeting the needs of the community. It's more of an interpretive um, self-analysis that the hospital could do. And sometimes more is not always better. So. If the hospital has a choice of investing in an existing program in the community that might address a need versus starting their own program, starting their own program will probably take more money but may not be as effective. So it's a very subjective analysis um, and one that we've had conversations with the Department of Health on. Uh, okay. So this leads to kind of the recommendation section for community health needs assessment. Um, First, our analysis, which is that mental health and substance abuse disorder counseling continue to be the most widespread community need throughout the state and in all of the hospitals. Um, Michelle, do you want to maybe go over this next bullet point? Because I think that came from you. Reducing deaths due to suicide and drug overdose. We're tying together the quality measures and the community health needs assessment. Yeah, so reducing deaths due to suicide and drug overdose obviously is an all care model agreement priority area. So hospitals working to address the gap in um, in many ways, and so some of the, some of the uh, points that Agatha talked through are listed there, um, including, um, like I had said before, that MAT initiation in the emergency department came up several times, and I found that really fascinating. You know, we talk about MAT access um, a lot, and we talk about it through the hub and but also we ask the ACO how many MAT providers they have in their network. Um, it's something that we're really trying to keep track of and better understand.
understand and if those patients are, are being served appropriately. Thanks, um, so. um, And then as in terms of resource allocation, we're trying to answer that question, how much are the hospitals investing in their community? Um, as we move towards population health, addressing the underlying causes of medical disorders and continuing to integrate with the community, with the, community the financial assessment of the community benefits becomes even more difficult to evaluate. So these costs are now being baked into the hospital budget. So for example, you, if you put a psychiatrist in the, in the ER, that's addressing a community need, but it's not gonna show up in Schedule H, and it's not gonna show up in the implementation plan. Um, so it's very difficult as the hospital integrates with the community to extrapolate the finances. Um, another example is the ACO fees that are withheld. Those are meant to go towards the community, community investment. That's not going to show up in an implementation plan or in a Schedule H. Um, so recommendations that we would have for July for when the budget comes in is um, some questions that you might want to ask or have the staff ask are how does the hospital how do the hospitals use their own community health assessment? How do they share their priorities internally? How do they communicate that to the different departments? Um, and how do the hospital assess whether its level of community investment is adequate? Um, what we would monitor as budgets come in are any uh, risks or opportunities that the hospital identifies that are associated to the <coughs> community needs, any provider transfers or acquisitions that are related to community needs, and any certificate of needs um, that come in or that we're alerted to that are related to the community. <coughs> Any questions about that? Just for uh, just one, oh, I yes. just have a comment. Um, um, I think the potential questions you have for the hospitals, I think that's going to be a good ad either whether it's during the budget process or, you know, for next year to include those in, you know, both for here when we talk about the wait times. Um, and maybe it's something, you know, if, if we were going to ask those at budget time, you know, that we send it out beforehand to them. Because part of this process of separating these things from the budget presentation was to try to streamline things. So we don't know how we can do that, but I really appreciate, you know, the questions and you know, that you guys are putting up there and asking. Thanks, Brian. Just a quick thought, slide. I'm looking forward as we prepare for 2021. We'll look at all the considerations, we'll get feedback from the hospitals, feedback from the Department of Health, and we'll try to integrate um, the results of the community health needs assessment into other Green Mountain Care Board initiatives like HRAP, CON, and the all-payer model. Great. All right, next is patient access wait time. Uh, and this is the last section. So first, um, first what I want to say is that of, um, we're looking specifically at patient wait times, which is a window into patient access, but there are lots of ways to look at patient access. Wait times is just one of the ways that we've been collecting data. So I want to say that out there front, because there's um, a lot of variation in the data that you're about to see. Um, so what did we do as staff, our methodology? We asked the hospitals to provide their wait times for all employed provider practice practices as of March 1st, 2019. This is a recommendation from the CFO work group that we had. Let's take a point of time and stick with it because these wait times change on a, on a daily, weekly, monthly basis. Um, so we asked for the third next available appointment as defined by the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. Um, I did look take a look at what IHI goals are and their goal for, you'll hear me say this later, but we're looking for benchmarks. Um, their goal for primary care is zero days to the third next available appointment and two days um, to the, for the third next available appointment for specialty care. Um, UVM um, and Central Vermont use an alternate metric, which is percentage of new patients seen within 10 days of the initial call. So in, in there lays some of the difficulty in this, doing a system-wide analysis is that of the 14 hospitals, two are doing them differently, but we can still um, see some themes and outcomes nevertheless. Um, some of the considerations, and this is a long list, is that um, the service types are not categorized. So it's basically an alphabetical list of services that could be offered at a hospital. They're not categorized, they're not tiers. So there, there's clearly a difference between primary care and neurology. Um, and you would, you would expect that wait times might be different for those two, but we're looking at everything kind of the same alphabetical list. 
So in the future, we might want to look at tiering the service categories. Um, hospitals added five additional categories. So what we did is we went back, we looked at what we asked, what was submitted last year, asked for that same um, information this year. Hospitals added five more categories, which is great. But what that means is that it's possible that there are hospitals out there that provide one of those five services, but since it wasn't on the list, they didn't respond to it. So it might be, um, we might be underrepresenting the services that are offered. Um, we recommend that hospitals be assessed in the context of their type, whether they're PPS or critical access hospital. Um, and PPS hospitals are indicated by an asterisk. You'll see them with an asterisk. Um, we, I, I, at first, I created a system um, average by service type and then decided I didn't like that because there's too many flaws in the data. Uh, I shouldn't say flaws in the data, inconsistencies in the data. Um, several categories have limited participation, so only one hospital reported on dermatology. You can't really create a, an average with one hospital or even two hospitals. And then if you have two hospitals, but one's a PPS and one's a critical access, you can't really develop an average for that too. Um, also, I didn't want to make an average because wait times can be very fact specific. There could be a, a doctor who's on FMLA, which critically affects their wait time on March 1st, 2019, but that doctor is back in action now. Um, or they could have been recruiting and onboarded a physician in April of this year. So they can, they can be so fact specific. Um, and then lastly, there was an inconsist inconsistent use of subcategories. So if the line item was primary care, primary care can have lots of types of visits. It can have a new patient, an office visit, a physical exam. And so there was this inconsistent use of subcategories. Nevertheless, even with all these considerations, there are some, um, some um, themes or outcomes, which you can clearly see <laughs> on this chart. <laughs> um, so this is, these are all of the, the services that we asked about in alphabetical order. And this line across indicates these are the services that we asked about, um, proactively asked about, and these are the sort of five categories that were added. So these are the ones where we might be underrepresenting the services that are actually provided in the hospitals. Um, most of the fact-specific circumstances that contribute to the wait time vari variations were workforce related. So this is a theme, is the workforce. Um, the wait times, as I said, are from a point in time on March 31st, so any <coughs> onboarding efforts aren't reflected. Um, this is certainly true for a lot of Rutland's wait times. Um, all the PPS hospitals are on the right hand side with a little asterisk. Um, Rutland reported that several of these with high wait times, they are actively recruiting and sometimes for many, many years they've been actively recruiting. Um, so we don't have any, any goals for any of the hospitals except for the IHI goal of zero days for primary care or two days for a specialty. Um, we're, we can ask the hospitals what their own personal goals are. Um, it'd be very interesting to know if they have internal benchmarks. Um, so again, you'll see this in the recommendation that that might be something that we ask for moving forward. So I'm gonna advance from this slide because it's probably nobody can read it anyway. Um, this is an this is central or I'm sorry UVM's ten um, ten days. Uh, percentage of patients seen within 10 days because UVM and, and um, Central Vermont were not on the other side. Um, so this, they gave it to us in alphabetical order. We resorted it into um, the percentage from 0% of patients are seen within the first 10 days all the way up to 100% of patients are seen in the first 10 days. Um, this is Central Vermont's version of that chart. And this slide is, is our kind of attempt to provide a system look, which is um, we looked at the, the services that had the highest wait times, um, and they are, they are all specialty care services, such as neurology, urology, and ear, nose, and throat. Um, we did attempt to do a system look for just, or an average, for just those, those services in particular. And, and uh, broke it up by critical access, PPS hospital, and then New Young in Central Vermont. Um, so for neurology, the results are listed urology and ENT. It's interesting, we can see here that critical access hospitals have a lower wait time in some of these, which begs the question um, about referrals. What are their referral patterns? 
So again, it kind of leads us into many layers. I should have started this presentation by saying that this, this report is presenting information, it's not presenting conclusions. It's a way of kind of identifying where, where do you want us to ask the questions or where would you like to ask the questions. Um, in, in an effort to connect us to the community needs, um, we know that primary care, psychiatric <coughs> and addiction treatment are, are um, um, needs that were coming up in the community health needs assessment. And we did the same sort of analysis, breaking it up by hospital type, showing UVM and Central Vermont's um, results. So from this chart, it looks like access to addiction treatment can be relatively quick, um, whereas access to me mental health treatment is, is not as quick. There's a longer wait for, for that kind of um, treatment. Any questions? We're moving on. So our sort of analysis, which I've touched on, is again, workforce continues to be an, an issue and is a significant component of wait time. Um, specialty care is experiencing higher wait times. Mental health, addiction treatment, primary care all have higher wait times. Primary care is exceeding a goal of zero days and their next available appointment. Some of the strategies for reducing wait times, the hospitals reported some strategies, um, are they're trying to improve their referral referral systems. So having um, UVM, I asked them specifically, they said that they're trying to centralize all of their referrals. So instead of sending out a referral to multiple offices all at the same time, and it could be sitting on a fax machine, or it could be sitting in someone's inbox, and they never really know who's gonna respond, they're centralizing it. So it's all in one place, and everybody can see it all at the same time. So they're investing, it's an investment, but they're trying to get around um, these higher wait times through better referral patterns. Um, hospitals are de developing better methodology for anticipating demand. This is very difficult work, but you can, um, hospitals are trying to look at the demographics of their population to predict what demand might be. Um, some hospitals are reporting that they are putting their physicians on call so that they have more coverage. The doctor doesn't have to be in the office, but they're available. I, I kind of see this, and I've heard this from hospitals and some of their presentations to the Green Mountain Care Board as, as sort of a short-term solution <coughs> because this, this has a burnout factor. Um, doctors also need to take their time off. So these are some of the strategies um, for reducing wait time that don't require hiring somebody because there's such a workforce issue. And I think that what you'll see from the hospitals are more of these creative solutions that reduce wait time um, without having to hire more, more providers. And so as we move into 2020, what we would recommend, I'm, I'm sorry, as we move into July 1st, um, and we can ask these questions ahead of time, some of the questions you might want us to ask are, what are effective strategies for reducing wait times? Right now, we sort of collected them from the hospitals as they came through reports, but we can be more proactive in asking those questions. I have a feeling there's a lot of very interesting strategies for reducing wait times that don't require hiring. Um, hiring. Um, what are the hospital's internal benchmarks? This will help us assess how they're doing. Sometimes having a, a long wait time is an okay thing. You need to balance access to services versus with what's appropriate for the community. Um, and how does the hospital determine, oh, I got ahead of myself. How does the hospital determine the right balance of access based on service type? And then again, what we would monitor as staff um, when we see the budgets is any risks or opportunities that are identified that relate to patient access or wait time, and any provider transfers, acquisitions, or CONs that are related to provider um, uh, patient access. So any questions on that? I just have one question. Um, I was curious if anyone mentioned telemedicine as a strategy for reducing wait times, particularly in some of the specialty areas. Yes, and I'm glad you brought that up, Robin. I have it on my next slide to talk oh. about. Copley did it specifically. <laughs> did, no, it's, it's right on point. Um, Copley did specifically, um, but I think, I think we should ask the, that to the, to the hospitals because it is appearing more and more as a strategy for patient access that doesn't require hiring somebody that um, we, should, we should probably call that question out specifically. Um, this slide, which looks very similar to the one we were just on,
this is a summary of all the recommendations. And right here in my notes, I say telehealth, not on the slide for today, but definitely relevant. Even today, we were listening about how telehealth is a way for rural communities to access services. Um, it's good for the hospital, it's good for the patient, it's good for geographically diverse areas like Vermont with lots of rural communities. So we might want to ask more proactively about that. Um, so staff will monitor CLNs, provider transfers, acquisitions, and budget requests related to mental health and substance use disorders. For example, um, we might see CLNs related to transitioning the existing ED space into safe and private areas for patients um, awaiting admission or transfer for mental health or substance use disorder. Um, we might see some, something in the budgets about putting specialized staffing in the ED, MAT treatment, um, having more, more and better people in the emergency rooms to help with these issues that are presenting themselves in the emergency room. Um, and this is a summary of the questions that we already discussed um, for community health assistance, patient access, wait time. And this just kind of moving forward, um, we will, as staff, as we move forward, look at the list of considerations, figure out how we can improve, how we do our analysis, how we ask um, hospitals for the information. We would consult with the hospitals in that. They're doing the work, and so they have ideas of how it could be communicated better or more effectively. Um, and also, I just want to flag that there may be some interest in collaborating with the Department of Health and the hospitals in the community health needs assessment, not so much standardizing it, um, but creating some system looks that would be helpful to elevate some issues out of the community, out of the individual report. There's 14 reports and they're very long. Elevating them out of the report and more into assist, uh, collecting the data in a way that we can do a system analysis. Um, so that is it. I think next is the appendix. Um, and in the appendix, just quickly, um, all of the individual reports are listed on the website. Um, which the link went active this morning, if anyone was looking for those. Um, and then there's several charts in the back that kind of show um, each hospital that reported on a, a service type and, and where they are. And then um, lastly, in Appendix C, this is very helpful, and thank you to the Department of Health for, for, Department of Health for providing this. It's a summary of each community health needs assessment for the 14 hospitals. Um, so if you were looking for the Cliff Notes version, this would this would be it. So any questions? So I'll, I'll start off just by saying there's a lot of information. Yes. Uh, a lot to digest, but one of the key takeaways that I, I take immediately is that um, maybe we could be doing this better by trying to create some more consistency and. And I know you said we don't want to seek standardization, but I'm wondering if a conversation shouldn't occur um, with the Department of Health, with us, with the hospitals, just to try to see if there isn't something that we could agree on that would give us all better information in a more consistent manner. What are your thoughts on that? Absolutely. Um, you know, we are, I can speak on behalf of the Green Mountain Care Board staff, which is that financial staff is that we're always very careful about what we ask the hospitals to report to us. And we don't want to just add reporting requirements for the sake of adding them. But something like this, where um, they're already producing the data, but it's not in a way that we can provide um, a system analysis, I think we're losing out in the hospitals and the communities might be losing out on an opportunity to develop deeper analysis and elevate, elevate the issues. Um, right now, you really would have to pick up 14 community health needs assessments and read them to get a, real, a deep understanding of what the issues are and develop your own analysis. And if we could work together, um, um, we could have more relevant reporting. Maybe if we work together, we actually could lighten by trying to make it very clear to people so they're not spending a lot of time trying to figure out you know, what, how to report, things like that. I, I don't know. But it it just seems like it might make sense if our staff, the Department of Health, and the hospitals just had a, a sit down and just saw if there were any common goals. 
I think it could um, definitely help maybe some of the smaller hospitals too that don't have a lot of staff to do these sorts of assessments that they could leverage a methodology that's successful in another hospital. Um, there could be a, a sharing of information. The other thing I'll just add from previous work I've done um, in this realm is that um, something to remember is that the hospitals are doing the community health needs assessments based on a very specific IRS requirement and so which is pretty well laid out and so asking anything additional um, that we might add between the health department while I absolutely agree, agree that collaboration is key in making sure that we're developing metrics that make sense they're really only required to report what's required of them for, from the federal government, um, which is something that we ran into in some of these conversations when I very first started at the board, so two and a half yeah, plus I years ago. I was going to add, we had talked to folks at the Department of Health about this very issue. I think it definitely would make sense just to regroup with the three parties and find out where we can make it more streamlined, but it, one of those things, and I think Michelle is alluding to that, we're always come, we have um, I think it's by monthly meetings with our BDH partners, and this is uh, one of the items that is always on the agenda. Um, but but I, if the hospitals are at the that. table, you know, well, I support yes, yeah. sitting down with the, the hospitals. I think it's a great idea. Okay, so I'm going to direct you to make sure that happens. <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> we will make sure it happens. Questions from the board? Jess? Um, so actually, thank you so much. I know how much work it took to try and summarize and condense and prepare the board for all the information we've received. And I look forward to actually digging deeper into the hospital-specific um, submissions. One thing I would just add about, and I like the <coughs> questions that you're posing for potential follow-up. One question I might add or think about and think about how we can think about is the consequences of the wait times. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that there's patient impact, are these uh, the patients that are, uh, you know, we're seeing these long wait times, but are they seeking care elsewhere, right? So are they on multiple wait lists and they're actually getting the care somewhere else, or are they not getting care at all because there's such a wait list and then their health outcomes are compromised? And I suspect there's a lot of the latter, but I don't know how to unpack some of that? Like what happens when patients are waiting on the wait list? Can they go someplace else? Are they getting access elsewhere? Or not? And do the hospitals know that? What's happening with these patients? So it's an excellent question, and we'll think about how to ask that, um, because we do know that there, there, are, there is referral within the system, and even to um, agencies or organizations that are not hospitals. Um, but we also know from that I'll use that mom's got any chart again as an example that one of the barriers to service was wait time. So people are not going to the doctor because of the wait time. Um, so I think it's it's probably a little bit of everything and asking the hospitals directly that question would help illuminate um, how it's being handled, what are the consequences to the wait times. But thank you for this. Mm -hmm. right. okay. Other questions? So now I'll open it up to the public for comments or questions. Susan. Uh, so, uh, first of all, thank you for the unbelievable amount of really good and very interesting information in this brief. Uh, one quick question is, I guess I'm supposed to be asking you, but yeah. Uh, do you collect the schedule ages and are those available for someone like me through the Green Mountain Care Board or do I have to get them directed from the hospital? We do collect them and we do post them. So they're part of, um, they're not labeled Scheduled H, they're labeled IRS Form 990. So that's what you would look for on our website. So there's a wonderful um, health think tank and I'm blanking on the name, it might be Millhouse. Anyway, they've done extensive writing on the community health benefit. And my understanding is that what the amount is supposed to represent is what the hospital would be paying if it wasn't a nonprofit. And so a lot of people in this room probably know that one of the first things Bernie Sanders did when he was mayor of Burlington was send UVM a tax bill saying, hey guys, why don't you pay your property taxes since we don't think you're given enough of that community benefit instead. So that was a long time ago, flash forward, Affordable Care Act, tried to corral some of this money because we all know that Medicaid can't pay for housing and Medicaid 
is really being leaned on to meet the needs of um, you know, social determinants of health in ways that it wasn't intended to, whereas hospitals can spend money on housing, <coughs> and UVM, we've seen in the state, has. Some states have actually enacted statutes to try to get at this question that you're starting to ask, which I think is the right spot on question, how much should they be paying? How do you measure it? I know it's complicated, but just even knowing what a ballpark or benchmark should be. Is it a percent of net patient revenue? Is it a percent of the overall budget? What should it be? So some states have actually passed legislation to direct that the hospitals, and they don't have nifty things like agreement care boards that they do it with other mechanisms, but to direct that the hospitals spend a certain amount of their budget on these community health needs. My understanding from the IRS process is that once they have their plan, they're supposed to account for the areas that they're not spending. So let's say they've identified mental health right up on top, but they spent all their money on fun runs or breast cancer awareness or something else, a good public health benefit, but not mental health. My understanding is they're supposed to account for that in a report that's gonna ask you to collect it, those reports, but also getting back to the, shouldn't there be an amount? Have you looked at what other states have done to try to come up with an amount? Yes, I have, in trying to understand that financial um, investment. I did see that other states are doing that. They are required by state law to collect that information, and you are exactly right about um, a lot of states are doing, I shouldn't say a lot, but some of the ones I was looking at, they're looking at how much the state, the hospital would have paid if they were not tax exempt. And then they're looking at the Schedule H to see if they've satisfied that requirement. But we are we do not do that in Vermont. That would be a, a an act of the General Assembly to require that. And just a reminder that you have to have a positive margin to be able to make investments too. So. Other questions or comments from the public? Great, thank you very much. So at this time, we're going to switch to a Rate Review 101 presentation. Do we have enough chairs for everyone, or are you doing this in shifts? I think we'll add as needed. Add as needed? <laughs> Associate General Counsel at the Green Mountain Care Board. And we are here today to do Rate Review 101. This should be uh, interesting, hopefully informative, and how do I make this work? Okay. Point, 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 okay. Yeah, point it to the computer. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'm going to start off by just giving a brief introduction uh, from myself and this is my colleague Tom. Hi, I'm Tom Crofton, um, Associate Director of Health Systems Finance. So after we finish our brief introduction, then we're going to hear from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate, and then we're going to have DFR and DIVA also join us up here for a larger panel type uh, presentation. So some of the topics that we're going to cover today are, what is the difference between rate review for large groups versus small groups and individuals? What are the consumer trends and issues uh, that the Office of the Healthcare Advocate is hearing about? 
what are the components of setting a premium rate increase? I say increase, but really it could be a decrease also. Who regulates insurance plans and rate increases or decreases in Vermont? What is the process for approving a plan or rate and implementing that plan and rate? And how do other regulatory processes in the federal landscape impact rates? So as I said, our hope today is to provide some broader context for rate review. We've had some large group filings earlier this year. We have some current small group and individual filings that are pending currently. So having said that, we are not able to discuss any of the current filings that are pending before the board. Um, so I will just say that right now. <laughs> and our I goal think is to have- it's important to reinforce that too because uh, when we get to the, the public uh, comment period, uh, it's going to be very difficult. I know some people might want to ask questions that are, we can't answer. So we could, when we get to public comment, limit it to comment rather than the questions. That would be great. So that we don't fall into any rabbit holes. Yes. I will also say that if you visit the Green Mountain Care Board's website on the rate review page, you will find information there on current filings. There's also an opportunity to provide public comment there. I know the Office of the Healthcare Advocate also has a web tool for providing comment through their web page that gets forwarded to the board. Um, and then in addition to that, we will be having our small group and individual hearings on July 22nd and 23rd, followed by a public comment there. So there will be multiple opportunities to comment on current filings, and we encourage you to uh, use those tools to do so. So, moving on. Just a brief overview of what we're talking about today. Uh, I am relatively new to the rate review world, so this I know for me it was very helpful to put our work into context when looking at insurance in Vermont. So some important things to note, these numbers are tiny, so I know there are handouts if you want to look at them. I've pulled out some of the highlights here. This is looking at data from 2017. Uh, I don't believe we will have full data for 2018 until later this summer or early fall. Uh, one of the things that you should know about rate review here is that we're talking about major medical insurance only, which means that we're not talking about Medicare supplement, long-term care, uh, vision and dental only plans, disease specific plans, or disability insurance. So you'll see from this slide that you see the population of Vermont, which was again as of 2017, and you'll note these numbers are rounded um, to the nearest thousand. Population of Vermont was about 623,000 people. And then you'll see, if you look at the insurance breakdown, again, this is just major medical insurance only, you'll see that the biggest chunk of the market is in Medicare and Medicaid, followed by the self-insured market, and then followed by the insured market, which is where the board has jurisdiction, and then there's another category for non-Vermont insurance coverage, and then the uninsured. For people who are not familiar with the term uh, self-insurance, this is where the employer provides the benefits to employees using the company's own funds, uh, which means that the employer, rather than an insurance company, is gonna assume the risk for payment of the claims from the employees. And um, just so you have some idea of where this data comes from, it's from multiple sources. It's from the annual statement supplement report, the Vermont Household Health Insurance Survey, the Vermont Healthcare Claims Uniform Reporting and Evaluation System, also known as VCURES, the Department of Vermont Health Access, and the uh, Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice. So now that you have a basic understanding of where we're going to go today, I would like to invite Mike Fisher up. Good afternoon. Uh, it's good to have a few minutes to um, uh, to speak to the board and to the public, though, um, to uh, healthcare-focused people <laughs> um, about uh, the healthcare advocate's role in insurance rate review um, and some of the patterns we see, some of the um, uh, some of the cases that motivate us. Um, so, uh, just quickly, um, uh, it was good for me to take a moment to reread the statutes, um, to uh, and to spend some time reading through some cases um, so that I could uh, prepare for this, but also it, it, it was a good exercise for me. Um, the HCA was created to act on behalf of Vermont healthcare consumers. That plays out mostly in our role helping individual Vermonters. Um, 
though that statement is broader than that, um, that is what um, uh, sort of backs up the call center and uh, our work uh, supporting the about 4,000 cases a year um, of people who, uh, who are in some way stuck in some part of the healthcare system, in some way not able to get the care they need. Um, the statute also gives us the opportunity to represent the interests of the people of the state in cases requiring a hearing before the Green Mountain Care Board. And that's really the section of statute that, um, that backs up our role in insurance rate review and um, sort of brings us to the table. Um, so sort of one of the obvious questions is, how did it come to be that there is an independent consumer advocate uh, uh, and an independent um, regulator? Uh, both at doing this task and some people may say boy don't you have a similar role or the same role in some ways and I think the answer is yes and no I think that it's an important structural difference that the advocate doesn't isn't saddled with a lot of the responsibility that the board has um, the advocate gets to argue in a little bit more of a pure way about the interests of the people as we understand that as we as we see them um, and to provide a bit of a, a counterbalance. Um, it's also, back to the first thing, it's also, I think, structurally very important that um, we have an individual advocacy role and a public and a uh, um, policy advocacy role. Um, they, um, um, it, it provides a, a bit of an interesting tension and I'm, I'm going to call it a bit of uh, attention. I, I, in the past, have often said how we're at our best when those two roles inform each other. But today, I'm reflecting a little bit on how um, those two roles are not always, con uh, they're, they're sometimes incong incongruous, not aligned. <laughs> <laughs> drive people, in, drive us in different uh, directions. And um, I, I was thinking that I would walk through a couple of case examples um, where that becomes clear. And, and I think um, in a real way, this became um, sort of in my face in the open enrollment for uh, sil the silver loading open enrollment this past year. Um, really smart people, really smart policy people sat down and we did the very best job we could to develop um, a plan that would work for Vermonters. and. Um, and it was the best option, and we did it. And our partners, all the parties worked hard at it, and we saw about half of the Vermonters who could benefit take advantage of it. Um, many, many Vermonters didn't act in the way that we presumed they would. And that got me thinking about um, just how different the perspective is as a, Vermont, as a consumer than the perspective is as a healthcare policy wonk and I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, so, um, so when, so and if I say any identifying information about a client, I have uh, changed those details, and um, um, like town or name or disease or anything like that. Um, so um, when we see somebody who is seeking better coverage when they have a health care need, um, the, uh, the general understanding of that is that is someone who is gaming the system. That is adverse selection. That is somebody who um, has sat on the sidelines until they needed care. And, then, uh, and, and we, in healthcare policy circles, poo-poo that. Um, but, um, when you put that in the context of a young pregnant woman who has a catastrophic plan and is seeking a, a better plan so that she can get the best prenatal care she needs, um, it creates a whole different meaning. And that also plays out um, uh, many times in the cases we, we see of people who uh, also who don't have coverage and who don't have a, uh, a life event that gives them a, um, um, a special enrollment period. 
Um, so, um, similarly, um, when we hear about people who are um, not following doctor's orders, who are, resist uh, who are not doing what their doctor asks, um, we would often hear people say that this is someone who is um, resistant to care, resistant to treatment. Um, when we put that in the context of a middle-aged guy from Rutland County who's a carpenter, um, who's at, believe it or not, 401% of the federal poverty level, is buying their insurance directly from, their, uh, from the carrier, um, and who has, um, who has a chronic condition, who's being asked to go to the specialist um, regularly at $75 a pop for the silver plan, uh, and who calls us in frustration because um, he just can't do it. And, um, you know, so, so I'll go a little bit deeper into this one because um, we would uh, quickly recognize the opportunities for this individual uh, about how they can qualify for some better supports, but there are situations where uh, the intricacies of family law and of healthcare law don't align and make it very hard for people to do what, what might seem obvious to those of us who are uh, in the middle of this. Um, and so then lastly, um, the, um, there are, uh, I do read a pattern of cases where somebody, um, well, they're happy they just got a promotion or they just got a job. And um, they're happy that they're gonna be able to leave Medicaid um, or they're gonna be making more income and be able, and, uh, and maybe their employer's offering them insurance. Um, but when they look at the details and they see um, deductibles of, of 4,100 to 2,800 or 7,600 to 15,200, um, I'm reading the deductibles from silver and gold standard plans, I'm sorry, silver and bronze standard plans there, and they do an analysis of what their likely care is, what they experience in their lives, and what their income is. And I recognize they're making a financial decision, not a healthcare decision here, but many people do. And it would be um, sacrilegious as a healthcare policy wonk for me to say I support that decision um, to not buy insurance and to uh, pay out of pocket for their needs. Um, so I won't say that because uh, we all understand the risks of such a decision. But um, I will say I understand that choice. And for many Vermont families, um, while it might look like a bad choice to healthcare policy folks, um, it's a reasonable choice. Um, so we see cases like that. Um, so it's with those cases in mind that we have a role in uh, arguing uh, on behalf of Vermonters uh, before the Green Mountain Care Board uh, and in other, entity, other places. And then I think the, the last thing I want to say out loud that um, I know I've said before, and I just think it's important to say again and again, and that's that, it, and I think many of us in this room experience this, this reality, that we have an opportunity to comment on pieces of the healthcare system in the con and, and in sometimes very specifically about that company in that piece. Um, we all know that there's no insurance rate without um, a hospital commercial rate. And we all know that um, uh, that the many pieces of the healthcare system um, impact each other. And it, sometimes it's hard to say that out loud when they're in the middle of an individual case. Um, but, um, but often our perspective and our frustration is uh, broader than the, uh, the individual thing we're arguing about. So, thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to take a moment to add some chairs. We're we going to add chairs, or are we going to swap out? Uh, both. <laughs> I think. Uh, well, we're all coming I think. Yeah. I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay, 
So um, moving back to some process, and again, I just wanted to thank the Office of the Healthcare Advocate for taking the time to come here today. Obviously, um, the consumer's experience is uh, an important background to what we do here today and what the board does as a regulator. So thank you again, Mike, for coming. And to move back more into process, I wanted to provide some additional context about large group and small group and individual plans and how those are rated. I have a chart here which just has some of the basics of the differences between um, the rate review for a large group versus a small group. As I mentioned earlier, just from a timeline perspective, we do receive large group filings uh, in January, February, March, sometimes later in the year, whereas for our uh, small group and individual plans, these are typically in early May. Um, as you will hear, there is a lengthy process that involves multiple departments uh, that needs to occur in order to have everything in place for open enrollment. I'm going to discuss a little bit later the differences between experience rating and community rating, um, but just be aware that there is a difference in the type of rate that the board approves uh, for both of, for those two different sections. Um, and the effective date varies for large groups. It will, the effective date for our rates will be January 1st for small group and individual plans. As many of you may know, there are uh, plans, the plans for large group are offered outside of the exchange. Small group and individual, there are some on the exchange and then also some outside the exchange, uh, which include reflective silver plans. And then subsidies are not available for large groups uh, or for small groups, but within individual uh, plans offered through the exchange, there are subsidies available. And then just, again, to take a look at the scale of what we're talking about during this rate review process for large group. Um, and this is the most recent data that we could have uh, for, the, for the 2019 enrollment year. About 17,000 covered lives for large groups. And uh, we, and I think, 75 is up from 2018. Oh yeah, for well, current. current, okay, 2019 is about 75,000 covered lives. So this is a big chart. Um, this is a nice visualization on how to look at what the components are of a rate charge. Change, that's a say change, um, a rate change. And, or premium. <laughs> or, uh, well, I, I just want to clarify that this is not how, this is not necessarily how, um, these components are within premiums, but what we're talking here about here specifically today is a change in that premium. So some, I just wanted to highlight a couple items from this chart. It has a lot of information, which I'm not going to go into in great detail, but I would like to point out a couple things. First is that the claims branch here up at the top comprises about 85 to 90% of a rate change. And so it's important to keep in mind when you're looking at this chart that these components are, are weighted differently. Um, so if you were to have a 1% change down somewhere at the end of the chart over on the right side, um, that, one, that wouldn't be a 1% necessarily reflected once you finally get to the rate change as a total. And I also added in a orange box up here towards the top just to highlight something that we're going to talk about a little bit later during the presentation for regulatory integration. This is where um, approved hospital budgets come into the rate review process, so we will circle back to that a little bit later. Um, and then I didn't know if Tom had any comments about some of the other components on here. Um, no, I think it's we'll get into that. Okay. So here, looking at, um, okay, uh, looking at the timeline and regulatory roles of the people you see here before you, um, you'll see that as we go through rate review, uh, there are responsibilities within different departments. You'll see that health plan design and compliance with federal parameters uh, is done by DIVA, who will present 
a plan design and recommendation to the board who will approve or modify and approve. You will see that form filings go to DFR and rate review will consist of both work from DFR as well as the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, once a rate has been approved, DIVA is going to certify plans and then there will DIVA will also work on open enrollment and again compliance with federal parameters related to open enrollment. Um, I will also, I noted at the bottom you'll see some of these steps are just for small group and individual plan rate review. That's due to some heightened federal regulations around those types of plans. So a very high level overview of large group rate review. And you'll see this process in many ways mirrors what you'll see later for small group and individual, but there are some differences. Again, the time frame um, is going to be different in terms of when the, uh, when the filings are submitted to the board. The board has 90, as with all rate review, the board has 90 days to review and modify, approve, or um, deny a rate and some additional details here I think um, I know that we're going to go a little bit deeper into process with DIVA so I don't know that I'll go into a huge level of detail here since much of the process is the same um, but I will say for a large group you don't often hear about them as much because it's often the case that the parties waive the hearing and so the board will receive a memorandum memorandums instead of having a hearing um, and again, keeping in mind that large group rates affect approximately 17,000 covered lives. And uh, one important thing to note that I mentioned a bit earlier was a manual rate. Someone on the phone. <laughs> um, is maybe a brief description of um, how the board only approves a manual rate for large group filings because large group filings are experience rated. And what this means is, if you think back to that basics of a uh, premium uh, component page that we showed earlier, when we're looking at a manual rate, you have all of the components of a premium that you saw earlier. However, the board only approves one manual rate for a large group filing. The insurer then goes and takes that manual rate and applies it to specific large groups and based on that large group's previous uh, claims experience will either adjust it above or below or keep it the same from the manual rate to account for that large group's particular experience. This is not the case uh, in small group and individual plans so uh, that is something that I will talk about a bit later when we talk about community rating for small groups and individual plans. Um, that is an important thing to note. While we're here, I'll also say uh, that when the board issues its decision and like with all rate review filings, the board uh, has to consider statutory criteria. Um, and I will just read that briefly uh, because this is, is, is information that you can see in the board's past rate review decisions if you'd like to learn more about how the board evaluates a rate. The board shall determine whether a rate is affordable, promotes quality care, promotes access to health care, protects insurer solvency, and is not unfair, unjust, inequitable, misleading, or contrary to the laws of the state. In making this determination, you'll hear things that are most relevant to providing context for uh, rate review today. So, to start off here, um, the annual process for analyzing and preparing the QHP plan designs begins in October. It may surprise some of you that for the 2020 plan year, we begin this process in October of 2018. Um, so we're kind of midway through that process right now, more than midway. And just to level set, so qualified health plans are what are available to individuals and small groups. So that's when Amber was walking through the two columns. We're now squarely on the individual small group side. That's right. That's a no exchange market. So the first piece in that time frame of October through January, I convene a stakeholder group that consists of representatives from each of our issuers, from the Healthcare Advocates Office, from um, a staff from the Green Mountain Care Board, and staff from 
DFR, Department of Financial Regulation, uh, others including myself from DIVA, and of course our contract with Actuary who, who has the professional guidance through the process, uh, financial analysis and so forth. So we, in the fall, um, take a look at the, the uh, guidance that's provided from the feds. More on that on the next slide, I'll come back to that. Um, and we have the task of making the difficult choices sometimes of um, making plan design or cost share change choices to keep the qualified health plans at each meta level in compliance. And again, more on what that, what that means, but that's our lengthy, and you know, we have a whole series of meetings in that time frame in the fall. Leading up to a presentation to Green Mountain Care Board in uh, late January, uh, along with our professional actuary, we present uh, the proposed plan designs for each plan, each standard plan, I should say, offered on the exchange. And a standard plan means that the same plan design is offered by each of the issuers on the exchange, so Blue Cross Blue Shield and MVP's Platinum Plan has the same plan design, for example, um, in the standard category. Um, present that in one meeting and typically return for a second meeting with the board for follow-up questions, for response to public comment, and then for the board's approval as proposed or with, uh, with changes. So that's what happens in the January, February time frame. And then in a few weeks following that approval, our actuary provides a lengthy uh, document as a roadmap essentially for the issuers to, pre to prepare their um, standard plan designs. Okay. And that's communicated through our actuary to each of our for, to each of our issuers. Right. Here's, I'm sorry, I was yeah. just going to add, I think one of the key points we want to make is how much of this is driven by federal regulation. So we're, um, you know, the design process sounds exciting, but um, it's really about matching the plan designs into a calculator that's provided by the federal government um, related to the actuarial value. So um, Dana will walk through what this looks like, but just to be kind of clear that a lot of this is coming from, um, from a federal source. That's exactly right. We have very tight guardrails that we need to work within to keep those plans compliant. So uh, the federal guidance I referred to is that notice of benefit and payment parameters. There's a lot of information in that, and that's the uh, guideline that we need to follow to present and maintain compliant plan designs. Included in that document um, is that federal ABC, the actuarial value calculator, uh, that has, <clears throat> it's basically a tool where we can, you know, through our actuaries, they run through the plan design through this calculator and it, the result of, of that calculator is what is the actuarial value of a particular plan. Actuarial value for those who may not know that is a, for example, a silver plan at 70%. Actuarial value means that the plan covers 70% of the cost of services on average, leaving 30% for the individual to, to cover, so it's 70-30. So the richer the plan, for example, a platinum plan covers 90% percent leaving 10 percent to the individual so higher premium what changes each year in the um, calculator is the cost of those services within the calculator so the same plan looked at for 2019 and 2020 may no longer fit the AV requirement because the underlying costs have been increased according to the decisions at the federal level of what uh, what trends should be applied for medical services and pharmacy. Also, uh, the services 
included within the calculator may change. There's a, not every um, service is included, most are, um, but you know, that may change a little bit from year to year. It's defined what the acceptable range is for each qualified health plan at a certain middle level. Um, typically, it's, for example, a gold plan at 80% has an acceptable compliant AV range of minus four plus two. So if they're at 80%, it could go down to 76% or as high as 82%. So the, and the, the maximum out of pocket amount is provided and other policy information that we need to you know, sift through, analyze, and um, bake into our plan designs to, to ensure that they're compliant. So as I said, those are sometimes difficult choices. The um, guidelines don't leave a lot of wiggle room and there are a limited number of factors that can be changed within a plan design <coughs> to, um, to bring a plan within the compliant AUD range. Timing is that the, the uh, notice of benefit payment parameters, the draft is typically released in the fall around November timeframe not always, and, and if it's later, that can throw out the rest of the timeline, such as this year, we had to make some adjustments, but um, anyway, I'm hoping that this is helpful context um, to start off uh, um, the uh, process for certification. Okay, so I think we'll turn it over to Hello, I'm Emily Brown. I'm the Director of Rates and Forms at the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, so I will be talking about the Qualified Health Plan form review. So after um, DIVA goes through the standards, decides what those should be, gets them approved by the board, um, the carriers then submit their forms to the Department of Financial Regulation. Um, so under 4062, DFR has the um, the ability to review forms for major medical. And as Amarin mentioned before, the standards for the rates in statute are the, sta are the same for um, the forms, meaning that they can't be unjust, unfair, inequitable, or misleading. So um, when we are reviewing contract language in those policies, those stand we're applying those standards as well as um, other benefit standards that might come from um, the state or the federal level. Um, so the first thing we obviously do is we make sure um, that the insurers are licensed and in good standing in the state. Um, we obviously, um, DFR is charged with company licensing as well, so that goes into our process to making sure that you want insurers offering these plans who are able to pay claims and um, who don't have any actions against them uh, by the department. Um, the next step would be to look at all the benefit and contract standards within the forums. Um, so we use Title VIII for that, but we also use Title XVIII, um, which is the Healthcare Administration chapter, and that also has policy provisions which we're required, um, or which the insurers are required to include in the forms. Um, other parts of the benefit standards are the essential health benefits, and these are defined by the benchmark plan, which was adopted by the Green Mountain Care Board um, at the implementation of the ACA. Each state has a different definition of what essential health benefits can mean. So Vermont has a specific definition that might vary from other states in the country. We also make sure that the state mandates are included. Uh, Vermont has several state mandated benefits in Title VIII, um, which insurers are required uh, to provide to policyholders. And then you have the federal mandate. So you have, whether it's coming through the um, payment parameters notice or other um, directives from the federal level, we want to make sure um, that insurers are providing uh, all the benefits that are required at the federal level as well. And then um, incorporating any changes uh, that come year to year through the, um, the uh, QHP standards working group that uh, Dana alluded to at the beginning. Uh, other things I thought were interesting that we look at is um, the annual limitations on cost sharing. So these come through in the, the SBCs of the summary of benefits and coverages. Uh, we also look at mental health parity, which come in quantitative measures, but also non-quantitative. So for instance, if um, 
you know, the plan had network tiering. We want to make sure that they're providing the mental and substance use disorder services at, uh, at the same rate um, that they are for the physical, um, the physical injuries. And we also look at the network adequacy, and this isn't necessarily part of the form review, but that is um, a requirement we have for uh, all managed care organizations or insurers operating in Vermont. And um, those uh, I-2009-03 contains those consumer protection and quality requirement standards. And um, I'm going to speak a little bit about DFR's solvency role that Amarin mentioned um, at her, uh, during her presentation. Um, so DFR uh, is charged with company licensing. So for any domestic insurer, uh, we are required to look at whether um, they are solvent and able to pay claims. Um, so for every major medical rate filing that is filed with the Green Mountain Care Board, we, we provide a solvency analysis. And that applies to large group as well as the small group and individual plans. And it varies depending on what type of, or if the insurer is domestic or foreign. So uh, based on how states regulate insurance companies, if it was a foreign insurer, we would rely on the, on the state where um, the insurer was based to provide us um, assurance that that insurer could pr could cover claims and operate in a in a, uh, a solvent manner. If it was a domestic company, then we DFR would be charged with um, doing the solvency analysis and making sure um, that the insurer had adequate surplus to pay claims. So I just uh, also wanted to talk a little bit about what goes into our solvency analysis. So. I think solvency can usually be explained in the context of adequate surplus. So uh, what that means is that you have to have um, a good amount of money through adequate premium um, to pay expected claims and uh, adequate expenses um, to operate as well as when it's appropriate to contribute to your surplus. And certain factors that can contribute to an inadequate surplus could be uh, if you had inadequate premiums, so if you weren't charging enough money to cover your claims and expenses. Um, adverse medical trends, so if there was a specialty drug that came out that increased costs or um, a period of, of higher than expected experience uh, in medical claims, that could also affect an insurer's solvency. And as well as a volatile regulatory environment, so when there are changes either at the federal level or the state level, that can have a direct impact on um, an insurer's solvency and, and basically affect their surplus. And then also um, something I think that some people don't think about is an increase in membership. So when you have uh, more people enrolled, all of a sudden your surplus, where it might have been adequate for a certain amount of people who you covered, once you are covering more people, you need to have a greater amount of surplus to make sure that you can pay those claims and expenses. Thank you. So moving back to the board's uh, role during rate review of small group and individual plans. This process looks a lot like what you saw on the large group rate review slide. I'm just going to uh, go into a tiny bit more detail here. You'll see that we mentioned that the insurers provide an actuarial analysis to support uh, their proposed rates. The board, the board has an actuary who reviews that analysis and does some of their own analysis, and you'll see that there are back and forth questions and answers between uh, the board's actuary and the actuaries at the insurer. Those, uh, those back and forth questions are, for the most part, posted on the board's website if you're curious to see what those look like. Um, in addition, as Emily was just mentioning, DFR provides its analysis to the board about the insurer's solvency. And then at least for the QHP plans, uh, hearings uh, are usually held. They are not usually waived. Um, and that's usually towards the end of July. This year is going to be July 22nd and 23rd. And at the hearing, you'll hear from insurers, you'll hear from DFR, you'll hear from the Office of the Healthcare Advocate. And then afterwards, the board will issue its decision. Um, as Emily mentioned, there are the same criteria that the board is required to look at as in large group. They will also look at for small group and individual plans. And some 
So a couple things to know about the, the market generally in Vermont for small group and individual. Vermont has a merged market for small groups and individuals, meaning that there aren't different rates depending on whether you are a small group or a certain set of small groups and individuals. So um, the reason behind having a merged market is that uh, with multiple markets, especially with Vermont's small population, you have a lot of volatility between groups and it makes it very difficult to predict what the experience is going to be, so it's difficult to predict what an adequate premium would be. Um, so by having a merged market of a small group and individual, the idea is that you'll have a more uh, experience that is more predictable because larger pools of experience are more stable. So in addition to that, um, something that I touched on briefly earlier is that our small group and individual merged market is community rated, which means that when I was discussing earlier about uh, large groups where the board approves the manual rate and then the insurer can adjust the premium that the, each large employer has to pay up and down based on the large employer's past experience. Uh, that is not the case in the small group and individual market. Everyone receives the same rate, so when the board approves a rate, uh, you will know what premiums are going to be charged to small groups and individuals. Uh, I'm, I'm going to pass it over to Tom briefly to talk about uh, what the impact of, of how Vermont does community rating when people try and compare Vermont to other states, because there are some important things to know when you see comparisons between Vermont. Um, and other states that are, um, that deviate from pure community rating. Okay, thank you, Amaranth. Um, as the QHP rate filings come in, as they're doing now, there invariably will be um, the want or the need for different organizations to compare um, rates state by state. Um, a couple of these organizations are Kaiser and Alvera. The thing to know is that most of these comparisons, especially when it comes to Vermont, are not on an apples to apples basis. Um, first, the usual comparison is um, second lowest cost silver plan at a specific age. So if they're using age 35 or 40, again, Vermont's going to be rated, so all ages are the same, rated the same. And one of the other big factors is they will use non-smoker rates. So they'll pick out lowest cost silver plan, age 35, non-smoker. In Vermont, um, we have tobacco blended rates. So it's the same for a smoker or a non-smoker. So just really to, to emphasize, a lot of those comparisons are not on an apostolic basis. Did just want to say the timeline uh, just again to highlight some of the federal influences for rate reviews also set federally generally it's more um, kind of permissive than state law but we do have to have final rates for the exchange generally in August um, which is how it has worked here traditionally as well so uh, once the rates are final then we, we step in with this final step so I just want to add to that this is so following uh, plan design approval following uh, the form review and approval from DFR, following rate review and approval, the ultimate decision on QHP certification, which means selection to be offered on the exchange is given to the DIVA commissioner. So we can you know, try to hold, hold back for some, for some big surprises, but it's just yeah, like I, like Addy said, it's a it's a bookend process, and it sort of begins and ends with um, Diva to make the decisions about which qualified health plans should be offered on the exchange. So I think I'll just give you a, a picture here of the activities that happen after final rate approval. And so I'm talking about. Uh, activities that are you know, highly focused from DIVA, but I want to point out that the issuers uh, are focusing on a lot of the same things at the same time. It's a very busy time to make sure that all of our 
information in our respective systems are updated accurately and will be in alignment in preparation for open enrollment. So right after uh, rate approval, um, there's a lot of preparation for uh, public facing materials on our websites and uh, information on paper and we have a plan comparison tool that all needs the updated uh, plan benefit and rate information um, to be in there uh, exactly right so that the consumer is shopping for plans um, either an existing enrollee or a new enrollee can, can see what uh, one plan is compared to another accurately. And there's quite a bit of work to get the updates into our respective systems, again, to guide consumers through. That's also in the August to September time frame. And in the middle there, that, that August to September step of updating the subsidy calculation factors, that's for uh, people enrolling through the exchange. There are several factors that go into subsidy calculations. Some are received from the federal government, such as the federal poverty levels and something like uh, referred to as the um, applicable percentage um, is updated each year. And then <clears throat> something that depends on the rate approval is the second lowest cost silver plan. That's the benchmark that's um, plugged into sub subsidy calculation. All of those things need to be available and updated accurately. And then in September, we tested uh, internally within the exchange and between the exchange and the issuers to make sure that all of our um, information and numbers are in there accurately. So certification is another um, step that's required federally of DIVA. Um, this, the timeline standard on the federal level is actually October for final certification and recertification. Um, but we work really hard to do that as early as possible in September so that there's time for all of this stuff to happen um, so that open enrollment can launch as federally required on November 1st. Correct. So that's the yeah, an overview of the process. to move on to some other areas that may affect uh, premiums and rate changes. One of those items is looking at regulatory integration. And so I will just preface my comments on this uh, with this work is ongoing. This is regulatory integration is something that we as staff are taking a closer look at so that we can fully understand how the board's work in one regulatory area, such as hospital budgets, is going to affect rate review and vice versa. And so first I wanted to just point out where we are right now um, in terms of regulatory integration and our understanding of regulatory integration. Currently, you'll see from the orange box up here, uh, this is the box where we're looking at approved hospital budgets. And so that will be a component that's looked at during rate review. An area that we are further exploring um, is utilization and how, um, and how, it, let's see, how can I say this? How we can get a better understanding of how data and utilization projections that occur during the hospital budgets can better inform the rate review process. And this, again, is some ongoing work. Um, it is important work because we estimate that about 50% of allowed medical claims stem from services and providers at Green Mountain Care Board regulated facilities. So we can see that there's a connection here and um, we know that there's data available both through rate review and through hospital budget review that could be useful in informing the rate review process. But how that, how that can happen is something that we're still exploring. So um, right now we have been looking at ways to better integrate year-end hospital performance into the rate review process. And we're also looking at how to monitor the commercial rate and NPR decisions made by the board in the hospital budget process. Um, 
how to monitor how to monitor the flow of those into the rate review process. So having said that, we recognize that there are some challenges in trying to go about this task. And um, one of those challenges is when we're looking at um, integrating data from these two different processes, we see that the services, the services that the data covers is different. Right? In hospital budget, you're looking at a Vermont hospital budget. Whereas in rate review, you're looking at Vermont and non-Vermont facilities generally, not just hospitals. You're looking at costs from independent providers, you're looking at retail pharmacist costs. So there's a lot of uh, additional services that are within rate review that won't necessarily be reflected within the data that you get during the hospital budget process. Similarly, when we're looking at uh, the patients and information from people during these processes, in hospital budgets, you're looking at patients who come from anywhere and everywhere into a hospital and receive services. They could be Vermont residents, they could be non-residents. Um, whereas in rate review, we're only looking at Vermont residents. So there's uh, overlap, again, in these areas, but they cover different segments of populations. Then when we're looking, a further uh, difficulty here is looking at the data itself in terms of its time frame. When we're looking at hospital budgets, we have data from the prior calendar year. When we're looking at rate review, because of the claims lag, you don't have the full calendar year data um, available during the rate review process. So again, much of the data overlaps, but is different. And in terms of how uh, hospitals report information during the hospital budget process, in terms of what categories and how, what categories of information are provided, and also how those categories of information are described, uh, differ from how we receive information during rate review. So not only is the information different, but the format of the information is different. So sometimes it's hard to unpack the data in a way where it becomes meaningful um, to use as part of informing a different process, if that makes sense. Um, so I will just also add briefly that I have, that this is focused primarily on the hospital budget process because these are two areas where the board, um, you, know, you can see areas where we need to look into this further. I have not really touched on the ACO and how that plays into here. There are um, obviously some regulatory integration areas there. Um, but I will just say I know that the ACO um, has contracts both with providers and insurers, so there are some integration built into the contract process. Um, and so for, for right now, and um, given that the results for um, the commercial program results for the ACO uh, for 2018 won't be available until later this year, our focus is currently on, at least for today's presentation, is on the hospital budget process and how that could um, impact rate review. So, is there Just a, um, uh, Passing it to Tom. Just, just to clarify that the hospital budget uh, year is October to September. Thank you. Yes, so there is that difference also. I apologize. Um, so, other areas that impact rates in looking at both the federal and the state landscape, I'm going to talk briefly about some state laws that are the result of some federal changes. The first one being the individual mandate, or more precisely, um, at the federal level, the federal financial penalty uh, ended. And while the federal mandate remains without a financial penalty, there was some concern that there would be a negative effect on enrollment in Vermont. <coughs> so first in 2018, there was Act 182, which created a state individual mandate for health insurance coverage. It's effective January 1st, 2020. There is no financial penalty. And then this past legislative session, H524, which has passed both bodies but has not yet been signed by the governor <coughs> or passed into law, um, establishes a reporting requirement for the state mandate so that uh, 
individuals who file taxes are required to check off the boxes saying that they've had coverage for each month of the tax year. Um, in terms of the individual mandate, like all federal and state changes, during a rate review process, the board would look at, would use actuarial analysis and projections to see whether there would be an impact on enrollment for a particular rate filing. And another example of a federal change that has created a state change, which um, may impact rates, is the loss of the cost sharing reduction funding, which was in late 17. Um, this would have resulted in significant premium increases for 2019 and 2020 plan years had the legislature not uh, acted and created an option for off-exchange non-QHPs. These are called reflective silver plans, which allow for silver loading of QHP premiums. Um, this is a very detailed uh, area, so I won't, go, I won't go into the weeds on this one. All I will say is that uh, the loss of federal funding created the need for a state law, which gave the state more flexibility in um, how they were going to address the potential for uh, a large premium impact. So as a result, we had Act 88, which allowed the state to create reflective silver plans um, in order to increase subsidies within to silver load within the exchange and increase subsidies and minimize the impact on premium increases. Um, going forward, there is some concern that perhaps silver loading will not be allowed after uh, the 2020 plan year. So this past legislative session with Act 89, uh, there is now the option for more reflective plans off the exchange and the board has the authority to approve those off-exchange plans um, and ensure that to the extent we are allowed to continue to silver load, uh, that we will do so, because that is where we receive the most subsidies and have the least impact on premiums. Addie, did you want to add anything to Addie or Dana on that one? I don't think so. Okay. 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 So I'm going to be talking about association health plans and just for some background, I realize I didn't put that on any of these slides. Association health plans have been around I think since the 70s um, when ERISA was implemented at the federal level. Um, association health plans are essentially vehicles uh, for employers to group together to buy health insurance. Um, so. Uh, these plans have dual regulatory authority, meaning like, the, meaning the feds and the states have the ability to regulate. Um, recently, uh, in the last year in June 2018, um, there was a DOL rule which expanded um, the use of association health plans and made them more accessible uh, for small employers and individuals to join them and to be able to um, buy health insurance. So there, when I say pathway two, I mean I'm referring to the new, um, the new pathway or the new way, or the new association health plan model that was implemented last year. In response to the DOL rule, DFR implemented regulations, regulations for fully and self-insured uh, MIWAs and AHPs. MIWAs are, AHPs are a type of MIWA. And then recently in March 2019, the district court vacated the uh, Department of Labor's rule. So currently we're in a state where um, the Department of Labor appealed the district court's ruling but did not request to stay. So officially the DOL rule is vacated for the time being and um, going forward there, the Association Health Plans operating in Vermont for plan year 19 can continue to operate but will not be able to renew coverage for plan year 20. Um, so DFR does have guidance on this, which is um, not on our website yet, so I know all of you were very eager to check your phones for that, um, but it will be published hopefully shortly. And this essentially um, relays the federal guidance that was issued, I believe in the past few weeks, that no new association plans will be able to operate for 2020 and existing association plans that were formed under the Department of Labor rules, so the Pathway 2 associations, 
um, cannot en enroll new members for plan year 19 as well as cannot advertise. Um, so next I'm just going to go through um, some pending federal litigation that I think expands a little bit on what Amarin was discussing and why a lot of um, state action has been happening, uh, especially in the last legislative session. So there are three cases um, that are currently working through the courts that I'd like to point to, and they all address different parts of, um, of the healthcare landscape. So the first one is Texas v. U.S., and this is the case um, challenging um, pretty much the whole ACA. So it was, it was started because um, the individual mandate penalty was zeroed out in the Tax Cuts and Job Acts. And um, essentially there was a challenge saying that without the penalty, um, the standalone mandate uh, was not supported by the Commerce Clause and therefore was um, was invalid, that the individual mandate was invalid, and then saying that the other AC, ACA provisions were not several, or the individual mandate was not severable from the other provisions um, of the ACA, so therefore the whole uh, ACA needed to be struck down. And the defendant's argument is that um, the individual mandate penalty remains, it's just uh, zeroed out right now, and um, that if the individual mandate uh, it, as amended is found to be unconstitutional, it is severable from the rest of the ACA, meaning that um, the provisions such as guaranteed issue and community rating would still exist. So the current status of that case is um, there was a district court opinion saying that the individual mandate is essential to the ACA and cannot be severed from the remaining position, so or provisions so essentially striking down um, the whole ACA. And currently I believe there are um, state AGs appealing this to the Fifth Circuit. The next case is uh, New York v. US, which has to do with association health plans. So this case um, challenges the DOL's ability to uh, implement the, the rule which I discussed earlier and uh, essentially argues that the DOL uh, was too expansive um, in its rule and therefore um, was not able to expand the use of association health plans as it did. Um, that rule, uh, that the district court uh, vacated the DOL rule and essentially said that it was an end run around the ACA because a, uh, a lot of association health plans um, do not have to comply with the ACA requirements. Um, the DOL has appealed the decision to the Circuit Court of DC, but it didn't request a, a stay, so the rule is still vacated as of now. And the DOL has issued two guidance letters saying that there is no comfort moving forward uh, for association plans to move forward for 2020. The last case I wanted to talk about was um, having to do with short-term limited duration insurance. So um, when the DOL put out the association health plan rule, they also um, issued a rule on short-term limited duration insurance. And this was um, previously an insurance that people could use in between jobs. It was limited to three months uh, in duration. Uh, it was not renewable. Uh, the DOL, DOL rule expanded the use of short-term limited duration insurance for up to three years. So it essentially interpreted the word limited duration to mean up to three years, and um, this is currently being challenged. The plaintiff's argument being that um, the interpretation of limited duration as three years uh, was, um, was not within the agency's discretion. Um, the defendant's argument is that the Congress, Congress didn't define short-term limited duration. They were leaving it up to the agencies, um, and therefore, uh, they should be able to expand the definition to 30, 36 months. And that case is still relatively in the beginning phases. Uh, there have been oral arguments and it's currently pending in the district court. Thank you everyone for your presentations. Um, I've put up some resources here so you can learn more about rate review on the various sites I included, the Office of the Healthcare Advocates website, 
um, as well as DFR, DIVA, and of course the board's uh, rate review page. Um, that concludes our presentation. I think um, if there are comments about the uh, how this, whether this was informative and helpful and other areas where um, information would be useful to the public, I'm certainly interested in hearing those comments. Um, as I said, we can't really talk about any current filings, but uh, we do hope this was of use for people going into the rate review season, if you will, for QHPs this summer, um, as well as sort of a preview on the board's work for regulatory integration and how that work will continue moving forward. So thank you again for having us. So I have a couple of questions, and Michael will rule me out of order if I start to <laughs> go down the wrong way. But Tom, you mentioned um, that uh, we had a, a, we were a tobacco blended state. Yeah. And who made that decision to be a tobacco blended state? I will have to look into that. I'm not exactly sure where that came from. I would appreciate that. I'd love to know if it's some federal or state statute that has to be tobacco blended under the ACA. I do sure. recall, and Robin probably remembers, um, a lot of the uh, fight that we had in the legislature years ago to get a ban to put into statute that um, would allow for some different pricing. So that's why I'm curious. It comes back to my past uh, activities. Okay, we'll look into that. <laughs> Secondly, uh, Emily, on your slide, um, it might may jump me quickly on this one, but um, you have no new members. And I'm curious um, if that um, means no new uh, attributed lives period to the plan, or if an existing employer could still add new employees. So that's a good question. So existing employers um, could add covered lives. So if, for instance, if someone got married um, who was employed and their employer was a member of the association, they could um, be added to the health plan but the association cannot accept any new employer members at this point. So if a company approached the association and wanted to join, they could not do that. And you said that would be posted today? It should be. I'm one of the few people the that The powers that be, I don't have control of, so. <laughs> Questions from the board before I turn it over to the public? Tom? So I have one quick uh, rearview mirror question. Um, you know, last winter, I think it was Agatha and Sean Sheehan put together this uh, very um, nice chart that kind of showed the, uh, the cliff, um, you know, that the healthcare advocate uh, referenced in, in his presentation. And, um, you know, it's, there's some very, uh, and this is kind of looking back at the, the 20, 2019, there's some fairly steep uh, angles that, uh, confront people um, should their income go up and just a, a couple of them are you know <clears throat> when you're below 400% of poverty uh, with all the subsidies etc um, the for a couple the um, <clears throat> low cost bronze plan is 2.73% of income and then when you cross that line um, above 400% of poverty it jumps to 13.8% uh, of income so it's a pretty steep issue and I had asked uh, last February um, if you folks could, the deeper folks could um, uh, kind of put a price tag on the increments from 400% of poverty to 450 and and 450 to 500 so we can just get a sense of, 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 of what that price might be, fully understanding that global commitment money couldn't fill that because, uh, because of, of, of the waiver restrictions. So I'm just asking, you know, how, um, where that stands at Diva and um, um, <laughs> Sure, I think what we said this winter was um, we definitely share the concern about the cliff and that uh, that population of the un unsubsidized um, individual market. So w we would love to chat with you about what it is that it would be useful to see. I mean, I think that we have some ideas about how we could address that group um, 
And I know you were looking at something that is kind of a version of expanding the Vermont premium reduction into that group. So I think I think we just need to talk a little bit more about what it would be what would be useful to see. If we could do that sooner rather than later. I sure, and I I don't think she's here anymore, but it will be Ina Backus, who's our director of health reform, who who is um, available to talk about that. Other questions? Okay, we're going to open it up to the public for comments. I wasn't sure, Sarah, if you were scratching your head or raising your hand. <laughs> um, I have only one comment. It's, it's, it's um, on the chart that you have that shows all the components of a rate change. Um, when you have the non-claims components, you have other. Um, and I would write very specifically um, regulatory or statutory changes that impact the plans or the coverage offered, because I think especially after all the discussion subsequent to that, that's a pretty significant component of rate changes. So just to be explicit, you've captured it there, but um, that was it. Thank Anyone you. Else? I don't see anyone, so I want to thank the panel. It was very informative. And, uh, thank you very much. Is there any old business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.